Today I am off lectionary, but I intentionally chose a passage from the Gospel of John uh, for today, for you graduates. I was reflecting this morning that I read this text a lot in worship, primarily at the end of someone's life because it is one of the assigned texts for funerals. Um, and so it's interesting for me to read it on what is not the beginning of your life, but sort of the beginning of your adulting life. Um, and so I'm listening to it from that lens, from John chapter 14. I am not worried about hearing a baby cry, and so I don't want you to be either, okay? Either you, Piper, I don't want you to be worried either. Yeah. John 14. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered, will you say this part with me? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus replied, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been with you all this time, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I've spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on account of the works themselves. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask for in my name so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. The word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, today's message is especially for our graduates. Uh, I hope the rest of us might hear something that is useful, but I wasn't about to prepare two different sermons this morning, so there's one, one for all. All right. When Jesus knew he would be leaving his disciples, he gave them two things. He gave them a meal to sustain them, and he gave them words to live by. Now, you're graduating, you're taking that next right step toward life, and we love you, and we're so proud of you. And we have fed you just this morning. I hope you got some of those cinnamon rolls. Those were incredible. I think you might come home just for that. I, I, I would have. But we've also fed you youth suppers, and VBS snacks, and countless potlucks, and connecting them all is the one meal that we'll be celebrating at this table in just a minute. We celebrate you today. We're aware that you have come through a kind of testing, and I don't just mean your final exams. You've had your education interrupted with a pandemic. You are coming of age in a time when the world seems mad with war and violence. 
and where things that have made sense to most of us, at least eventually, they just seem not to matter very much right now. Many of us are still carrying stress fractures in our bodies, hearts, minds, and spirits. So I want to give you some words to live by and to share with you a meal that sustains us all. Now, the words that Jesus gives his disciples in John's Gospel in chapter 3, uh, I mean, it's three chapters long, chapters 14 to 17. It's, if you're a professor, you will understand this. It's like reading somebody's dissertation, you know. It's not that a dissertation is long and boring, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I, yours was not, I am sure. But. but compared to the other texts that we have about Jesus and the other Gospels, those are very short sayings. In this gospel, it's a sustained message. It's three chapters long. It's very long. And it's a lot to remember. But if you get stuck on that, I want you to remember just this one part. Jesus says, he is the way, truth, and life. So those are the words of wisdom I want to give you. Way, truth, and life. And I want to say it this way. The way of Jesus is more powerful than the name of Jesus. Now, some might think me heretical for saying that. Surely the name of Jesus is the most powerful name in the world. Yeah. But saying the name without also walking the way is like picking up a stick in your backyard and waving it around, thinking you're doing magic. The way of Jesus is more important than the name of Jesus. In this world, you are going to meet a lot of folks who know the name of Jesus. And many of them will try to use it to get you to buy things, or to vote for things, or to subscribe to things. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But everyone, do you know what Jesus said next? Everyone who does the Father's will. The way of Jesus is more important than the name of Jesus. We know the Father's will by looking at the life of Jesus. So don't sell out and be content with simply hearing the name. That's one of the reasons I picked this image for the slide today, because if you look at that, you see a path. Well, the thing that a path suggests is that someone has walked this way before you. Their footsteps over many years have created a path for you to follow. You see, it turns out you don't actually have to invent your way so much as you do to follow the path. So look for those who are walking the way. You'll recognize them by the way their souls can bear hardship with peace, who can meet suffering with patience, who go out of their way to notice the people nobody else notices and offer kindness and friendship. You'll recognize them by the way they offer you friendship without strings. Now, because you've grown up here, you have been blessed to have met many of them in this faith community already. When you encounter someone whose ways remind you of Jesus' ways, compassion, peace, kindness, bringing healing to those whose lives put them always at the margin. Be at peace with that person. When you have choices to make in your life, ask yourself, will I be able to defend this choice with Jesus as my way, truth, and life? Now, you're going to make mistakes. Hands up, those who have made mistakes at this. Okay. You're going to make mistakes. And Jesus is forgiving. But if you start with that question, not what am I asking in Jesus' name as Janis Joplin did, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz, right? 
but rather, is this decision in front of me something I will be able to give a faithful answer for? Then you'll be walking the way. Frederick Beekner talked about vocation as the place where the world's deep hunger and your deep gladness meet. The thing the world needs to have done and the thing you feel great joy in doing, that's your vocation. Throughout my um, ministry, I've worked with many different campus ministries uh, and met, gotten to meet many students who regularly astonish me with how they articulate this. One would say, I'm majoring in economics and I plan to make money to support myself and my family as an accountant, but my vocation is to bring basic medical care to people who live in Haiti. So every year I go on spring break to be part of a team doing basic dentistry. Another said, I'm in med school and my vocation is to work with students, with uh, children receiving oncology care. So I wanna be a doctor and my vocation is to treat children who have cancer so I can give them the best chance for a full life. Another one said, I'm studying marketing. I hope that when I graduate, I'll get to work in media. But my vocation is to write praise songs for children's choirs. Way, truth, and life. Anne Lamott gave a graduation speech several years ago. I think it still holds up. This is her advice. Find a place to stand and light to see by. A place to stand. For me, and I hope for you, that speaks to the truth that is Jesus. Again, not just who he is, but how he did life. Let the place you stand be the path of discipleship. Once you know the truth that is Jesus, you can recognize it anywhere. Learn to value your life not in terms of your net worth as a taxpayer or a voter or a cog in any machine. There will be many voices asking you to do that. I want to invite you to value your life through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is the light by which we see what matters in life. Here's a hint. It's not guns or guts or diamonds or trucks or stocks or houses or influencers or followers. It's not any of those things. Jesus is the light by which we learn to value friendship, courage, steadfastness, those are the things we see him measuring his life by. And by the way, no extra charge. You learned all of that when you watched Lord of the Rings. Okay, so they're there. If you're blessed, then one day you're going to get to be old like me. And you'll start to wonder, what's it for? And those of you who are my age or older, head nods to that. Are you starting to wonder that? What's it for? You might wonder if you're rich. Try to be rich in relationships and in impact. Be somebody else's light to see by. Now, in this same setting of this dissertation by Jesus, after his, um, if you will, baccalaureate speech, Jesus stood up from the table and he did not drape a cap and gown around his body. He draped a towel around his waist. That was his cap and gown, the towel of service. His diploma was a bowl of water. And armed with only those two things, he went to his friends and knelt before them to do the task of a servant. Imitate me, he said. Or as Bono said, if you want to take a stand, better learn how to kneel. At the same meal, Jesus took the bread and the wine on the table at every meal, sort of like our tea and biscuits, and he gave it to them.
take and eat, he said. It's my body and blood. Every time you do this, do it in remembrance of me. St. Augustine, a holy man who lived in the fourth century, tried to explain this meal, and I was reminded of this recently uh, by Dr. Warren Smith, who preached the baccalaureate sermon at my daughter's graduation from Duke Divinity School a few weeks ago. Yes, she got the same hood. I was proud. Augustine, or Augustine, some people would say, wrote, uh, and Warren updated the language just a bit. So, he said, if it is you that are the body of Christ and its members, you are the mystery that has been placed on the Lord's table. The mystery you receive signifies who you are. You affirm what you are when you reply, Amen. So, be a member of the body of Christ in order to make that Amen true. When you were prayed over for your sins, you were being ground like that wheat. When you were baptized, it is though you were mixed into dough. When you received the fire of the Holy Spirit, it is as though you were baked. Be what you see and receive what you are. I think perhaps fitting on this Trinity Sunday, it might be more accurate to say Jesus gave them three things, way, truth, and life, yes. A place to stand and a light to see by, yes. He also gave them a community to stand with a community who remembers who we all are at this table in this meal. Way, truth, and life, a place to stand and light to see by, and table, the sustenance for this way of life. Be what you see, receive what you are. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.